Hello, and welcome to another session of David Starkey Talks. Today, I want to talk about COVID, the crisis, and above all, inflation. Let me begin. It's traditional, isn't it? When uh, you write a newspaper column, you do this kind of thing, you tell a little story. It actually goes back to Cicero, the idea that an introduction should sort of tease people and get people a little bit excited. Anyway, uh, well, it was quite exciting. Uh, last week, um, last Friday, I went to a fascinating uh, event near where I live here uh, in Canterbury. It was uh, given, it was an amateur production by the oldest amateur uh, dramatic company in the world, the Old Stages. It's founded, needless to say, old, it's British, it's founded in 1842, so it's 180 years old. And for every year after that, there has been a performance or series of performances by the Old Stages. Except in the two world wars, 1914 to 1918, 1939, well, there was a performance, but as everybody said, there was a terrible sense of foreboding. Uh, so from 1930, from 1940 to 1945, and then again during the COVID crisis for two years, there was no production from. 2020, 21, now 2022, the production which I saw. So, war, and as they put it, you know, amateur dramatics, a little bit of drama, <laughs> war and pestilence. Well, as I've argued publicly, I didn't think much really of Covid as a pestilence, if you compare it with the great plagues of the past, the great pestilences of the past. It was honestly a piddling little affair. The Just the brutal facts of deaths, a fraction of 1% of the population, the Black Death, the cumulative total, probably 50, 50 times, more than 50 times as much. However, if it was piddling as a pestilence, our reaction to it, or if you take my view of it, our gross overreaction to it, turned it into a great event. Indeed, I would argue that the way that we should look, and this is why my little story of the old stages suspended in the First World War, in the Second World War, and in the, what I would now call the Covid phony war, we should really judge where we are now in terms of the fact that we're in a post-war situation. That Covid, or rather the decisions to lock down, to furlough, uh, gigantic borrowings and all the rest of it, produced the same kind of disruptions that you would expect in a major war and the same kind of consequences. Let's just investigate that idea a little bit more. Those of you who have been watching these talks will, I hope, remember one in which I did a detailed comparison between Boris Johnson and David Lloyd George. And I pointed out, that, the, apart from the fact that they are both led by their pricks, um, they, they are uh, disruptors, arch disruptors, outsiders, figures who disturb the status quo. And of course, they're both creatures of crisis. Boris of Brexit, but also of Covid, David Lloyd George, supremely of the First World War. And again, as I pointed out in that, uh, in that, that earlier video, the, there are astonishing resemblances in the impact of the First World War on government, the First World War uh, on government, when it's led by the disruptor Lloyd George, uh, and similarly the effect of Boris Johnson, partly Brexit, more, I think, Covid. And I identified several things. You get the shrink, the abandonment of cabinet government and instead the shrinkage down to a handful of ministers that act as a war cabinet. You get the, uh, the um, uh, as well as the war cabinet, you get the role of businessmen. 
and brought in to government to handle things in the First World War. The whole question of food supplies, munition supplies and that kind of thing in Covid, of course, particularly the business of the supplies of protective equipment, the immensely contentious business of PPE. Now, can we just pause again and work out just how accurate the comparison with war is? There have been huge criticisms, haven't there, about uh, the kind of rather shady figures that were involved, shady figures in every sense of the word, both persons and the actual the amounts that were paid in the sense of numerals, the shady figures uh, involved in the acquisition of PPE. Uh, yes, indeed. But think, it's exactly the same situation as in war. You are desperate to acquire munitions. You're desperate to acquire food. You're desperate to acquire goods, uniforms, everything. And so, of course, you pay too much. You don't apply proper um, quantity controls. You don't apply proper quality controls. And there, are the, there have been photographs recently, haven't there, of these vast warehouses stuffed with decaying plastic that was acquired at enormous cost from various bits of the Middle East and will never be used. Maybe a little bit will be donated to the third world or just thrown away or otherwise disposed of. Shocking, isn't it? But when I was a boy, when I was a young man, when I was first involved in the gay scene in London, well, there were the consequences from real war, the real military, because in those days, left over from the Second World War, uh, there'd been vast expenditure on armaments, military with very much bigger army, navy, air force. There were things called army surplus stores. Do you remember them, some of you? My age might. Some of them were very naff and, uh, and sort of hole in corner. Some were rather stylish. Uh, there was a particularly stylish one at the bottom of Hampstead Road in London called Lawrence Corner. And I remember trooping there, and again, a little bit of self-revelation, as a you know, really quite well put together uh, a youngish gay man acquiring my uh, bits of military uniform for titillation in various clubs, you know, uh, looking rather good in a sailor suit. God help me. <laughs> and <laughs> camouflage trousers with a web belt and all the rest of it because there'd been huge, huge overpurchase exactly like PPE. So maybe we'll actually see PPE surplus stores uh, springing up, though not, I think, at the foot of Hampstead Road. <laughs> the property prices are now a bit too great. But I'm making the parallel between Covid and war. So the disruption of government and also some good things coming out of it, exactly as in the First World War, uh, you got, as it were, and people from outside coming up with winning devices um, uh, um, with, 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 with the convoy system. So, of course, Kate Bingham, to the miracle relief of Boris Johnson, uh, came up with the vaccine task force, which actually delivered the vaccines, deliberately disrupting the, the existing patterns of government. Well, that was a good form of disruption. But, of course, there have been loads and loads of very bad forms of disruption. Indeed, so much of our current crisis, but nobody will admit it, goes back directly to the decisions that were taken with lockdown, with furlough and everything else. The extraordinary disruptions, particularly in the civil service, caused by working from home. Now, you can work from home if you are high creative like me, but most of these people aren't. Most of the civil servants in the DVLC, uh, most of the civil servants in the passport office aren't high creatives, at least one hopes to God that they're not. They should be engaged in a boring, routine, um, uh, bureaucratic task which demands discipline, application, rules and frankly a, a beady eye on progress. The things that you need from office discipline that you cannot have if you work from home. And of course, it goes vastly beyond that. We all have been taught that we want um, you know, work-life balance. Wasn't it lovely being at home, 
paid for doing nothing. Look at the number of people who've dropped out of the workforce. I think if I were a cynic, I would say that the enormous price rises in food and even more enormous ones in, in fuel and whatever will have some wholly good results. They'll knock people back into work because I'm rather a believer in Lenin, of course, who one respect, who got the phrase from the Bible, he who will not work, neither shall he eat. Not to say work all the time, because we don't eat all the time, but activity is necessary. And the notion that you can simply swan around doing very little and being paid rather a lot simply seems to me to be both personally and communally and nationally catastrophic. So a whole series of terrible, disrupting results to ordinary methods of life and existence. Again, precisely what you expect from war. One looks at the you know, spectacular disruptions. We're more familiar with them, uh, with the idea of the First World War, of course, with what we see as the stability of Edwardian England and that gigantic disruption, the turmoil, the inversion uh, that, 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 that followed the horrors of the First World War. But there's one thing that I want to focus on, I want to focus on very closely. It is the consequences of war in terms of inflation. Let's just accept then that Covid equals a phony war. I've argued already that the consequences of this phony war for government, how government's organised, and for how society runs, or in most cases doesn't run, the consequence the war may have been phony, but the consequences were very real. I think it's exactly the same with inflation. Let's look at the figures. We mentioned the First World War, we mentioned the Second World War. Inflation figures. First World War, 25%. Britain came off the gold standard, which, which enabled that. Second World War, relatively contained, 17%. The Crimea War, 15%. The Napoleonic Wars, a gigantic 36%. Well, what's going on? Well, let me deduce something that relates more directly to my own particular historical period. One of the most rapid periods and most shockingly rapid periods of inflation in English history, because it took place against the background of such extraordinary stability and indeed deflation, was the reign of Henry VIII, in particular the 1540s. And the 1540s show, 1540s again, a period of major war, war against France, war on two fronts, the classic thing, war against France, war against Scotland, um, uh, uh, combined with a vast program of rearmament in terms of naval building, and also the huge program of Henry VIII's fortification of the entire coastline on the, of the country. I mean, vast part of the wealth of the monasteries disappears simply on that. So a vast program of war, munitions, armament and fortification. How does Henry finance it? Well, obviously the confiscation of the monasteries, but that was nowhere near enough. And instead, you multiply the money supply. You do it in two ways. You actually reduce the fineness of the silver in the coinage to an extraordinary extent, to the point at which some coins virtually had no silver in them at all. And you also, even more, you multiply the quantity of coin in circulation. Probably by 14 times. 14 times. The result is, by the end of the 16th century, you have had six fold inflation. Now this tells us, this tells us essentially what is the cause of inflation. And again, it warns us very, very definitely, an inflation is not a price rise. We need to distinguish. Inflation is primarily because of the multiplication of the money supply. That 
is what happens. The Henry VIII one is the literal manifestation, the most obvious one of it. It's called the, because it's called the debasement. You've got a standard, you've got a gold standard, a silver standard, and you deliberately devalue it. You reduce the bullion content of coins and pretend they're of the same value. And of course, people don't believe you. And the result is that when you've reduced the the, the, the silver standard by and from you know hundred or virtually hundred percent to twenty five percent, effectively the coin is now treated as though it's worth a quarter of what it had been before, and so on and so on. And in all the different ways, those great crises of war, the First World War, the Second World War, the Crimea War, and, and above all, the only one that really bears direct comparison with those Henry VIII wars, the Napoleonic Wars, you see a gigantic multiplication of the money supply and a corresponding soaring of prices. Well, we've had price rises. They're fortunate at the moment, 9 10%. But in comparison with the extraordinary stretch by modern standards, a price stability that we've had for the last decades, the so-called period from the 1990s, the so-called great moderation, the the Goldilocks, uh, the Goldilocks effect, uh, as as it's acclaimed by the for, for and described by the former, neither too hot nor too cold. Uh, as it's described by the former governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, uh, that that period of the Great Moderation, the Goldilocks effect, suddenly now we've seen the driving up of inflation. And it is. Why? It is, quite simply, isn't it? Because we had furlough. If you look back at those earlier wars, the real wars, of course, huge quantities of money were pumped out in the form of loans, sometimes the debasement of the currency, sometimes the multiplication of fiat currencies, paper currencies, and so on and so on, and vast government borrowings to finance it, and so on. But of course, in that period, the economy was doing what? Well, it's a wartime economy. It's distorted, but it is working absolutely at full belt, you still get inflation. What did we do during Covid? We pumped, Rishi Sunak pumped through furlough, loans to individuals, loans to companies and everything else, some £300 million. 300, let me get right, £300 billion pounds into the economy. And then you froze the economy. So you pushed this gigantic amount of money into an economy which you'd shut down. So you literally have the money you give people rattling in their in companies, rattling in their pockets and in their bank accounts. And then what you do, having shut the economy down, you press a switch and you open it again. You open an economy that you have put to sleep, that you put is more than it was more than anaesthetic. It was put into a deep coma. Look at what happens when you try to restart an airline, restart an airport. Well, if you're travelling and have the misfortune to travel, you will know. We've done that with the entire economy. We threw vast sums of money into it. We gave people nothing to spend it on, and suddenly we say, OK, you can go out, you can shop, you can buy things. And at the same time, of course, it's even worse than what I described. It's not simply domestically that there are problems. There are huge problems with supply chains of all kinds throughout the world. So what happens to the price of goods? Well, they go up. So. But let's just pause a little bit. Those of you who are interested in this kind of thing will say, oi, oi, and quite rightly so. The device that was used to uh, finance the, these extraordinary borrowings was, of course, this wonderful thing called quantitative easing. You know, rather bloated chap who lets his belt out, except it's really slightly the opposite, but there we are. Um, what is quantitative easing? Well, it is 
when the government issues debt, issues, you know, bonds and whatever with a rate of interest. But the bonds are bought up not by the punter, not by companies, not by investors who would have to give real money to buy them, but they're bought by that government's central bank, which can, of course, simply print money to pay for it if it chooses. In other words, it's a really cosy process. The central bank um, uh, uh, buys the government debt and receives a, a bit of interest. Um, and then you know, if the, if the um, if the, uh, as, as is happening at the moment, if you want to unwind quantitative easing, uh, what you do is the, um, the, the central bank uh, will then sell uh, the debt on, it will sell the debt on to real people, who then, of course, the real people do require real interest. So suddenly money starts to go outside this cosy charm circle of the government and of the central bank, which is sort of what's beginning to happen at the moment. But of course, those of you who follow these things will remember this is not the first time that we've had quantitative easing. Quantitative easing was invented, was it not, by that man of the moment, that great heroic prime minister who knew he was destined for the role, who brought down Blair and strode triumphantly onto the world stage, Gordon Brown. And it's Gordon Brown who invents this device to overcome the financial crisis of 2008. The idea that you can, in fact, borrow infinite amounts of money at no apparent cost whatever and use it as it was used in the aftermath of 2008 to refinance the banks which were of course at risk of going bust uh, because of various silly policies uh, that were sponsored by the way by the Clinton government like the Fannie Mae and, uh, and Freddie Mac or was it the other way around which in fact amounted to giving mortgages to people who couldn't actually afford them. You know, that's where it all starts. Anyway, anyway, let's not bother to go back there. But the big question you will all be asking is, well, we have the financial crisis. We had Gordon Brown rescuing the world uh, with the notion of quantitative easing. But you will say, Dr. Starkey, we did not have inflation. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, we did. But a rather special sort of inflation. Because if you actually look at where all that money that was, that was generated, invented, went, it essentially went to banks, to institutions that lend money. It didn't go to the general public. It wasn't shoved into people's pockets. Instead, it went to banks. And what did banks do with it? Well, banks are in the business of lending money to make money. Uh, and they lend it on the whole to people who've got money so that they can acquire stocks and shares and they can acquire property. Have you noticed what happened to the price of assets since 2008? They have gone through the roof. Look at property prices. Look at share indices. Look above all at tech shares and so on. So there was a very particular kind of inflation from 2008. It was an inflation of asset prices. Fine. But it means, of course, that in the background to what happened um, uh, in, uh, 2020, in 20, uh, 2020, 2021, in the background to that, there was already a huge amount of money sloshing around in the system. So it had always, it was as it were, primed. And by the way, I can give you an example. Um, the last time we had this kind of deliberate engineered boom, I can remember it very vividly. It was the Barber boom, Anthony Barber boom, the beginning of the Heath government in 1972. And it gives you an idea. This is the moment which ushers in the great inflation of the 1970s. In the course of 1972, I know, because I was getting my first job and buying my first property, property prices in one year multiplied three times. So in other words, you first get 
in these great inflationary waves, you first get a multiplication of asset values, and then it diffuses into the larger economy, as happened catastrophically from 73 onwards with, with war in the Middle East, again, rather like now, huge spikes in the price of fuel and all the rest of it really blowing the whole system up, as it very nearly did, until we finished with the winter of discontent and Margaret Thatcher. So what we can see then is that the, 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 the quantitative easing of 2008 led to the vast inflation of asset prices. The quantitative easing that is needed to pay for furlough and all the other measures of COVID and lockdown, that does the next stage. It puts money directly into people's pockets at a time when the economy is basically shut down. The moment you open up the economy, an economy which is now violently malfunctioning, both on a national and an international and a global scale because of the problems of lockdown, disruption to supply chains, China's own excessive lockdown, ludicrous lockdowns and everything else, you suddenly have far too much money chasing far too few goods and services, so prices go through the roof. You will now, some of the rest of you who are very bright will be saying, some of you are not so bright, will be saying, oh, but what about, what about Putin? What about the real war? It is a real war, but we're fighting it by proxy. What about the real war in the Ukraine and the consequences for fuel prices and everything else? The extraordinary winter of discontent, another kind of winter of discontent and not a metaphorical one this time, that we will be facing, uh, we are told, uh, this winter with vast multiplication of heating costs and so on. Yes, indeed, but that is a price rise. That is having to pay more for goods which are in very short supply. That has not caused the situation that we're in. It is undoubtedly exacerbating it, making it very much worse. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe that the prime cause of what's going on, uh, if, if, sorry, if you think that the prime cause of what is going on uh, is, is the Ukraine war and the consequent disruptions of supplies of gas, oil um, and, and uh, grain and so forth, may I invite you to look at the United States of America. America is self-sufficient in fuel, self-sufficient in gas, it's got fracking, it's got it's self-sufficient in oil, and it's vastly self-sufficient in agriculture. It has inflation of exactly the same level that we've we have for the simple reason that above all the Biden government has thrown vast quantities of money you know, a, a, a public debt of whatever it is seven trillion um, uh, on an extraordinary scale so America is now getting on for being as indebted as Italy and Japan gigantic quantities of money and money that's put directly into people's pockets or into um, 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 imaginative um, infrastructure projects even using some of the same language that we are familiar with under Booster Boris build back better so a country which America which is not experienced the inflation of fuel, which not in and get that right again, which has not experienced price rises of fuel and food still has comparable levels of inflation because the money supply has been jacked up through this device of quantitative easing. But why are you not hearing this from the contestants for the Tory party leadership? Why above all? Are you not hearing this from Keir Starmer? Why are you not hearing this from whoever is, I even forget, uh, the Labour Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, um, who is the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer? Why the resounding silence? Why is the BBC not clamouring? Why isn't Martin Lewis clamouring? Well, Martin Lewis, in fact, is doing exactly the opposite thing. Had you noticed, he's now declaring that the coming winter of discontent, the inflation of fuel prices, is going to be, and he actually used the phrase, 
a national crisis of the order of Covid. And he's dropping strong hints that you need the same measures. In other words, the equivalent of furlough, putting money directly into people's pockets. That's Martin Lewis. I remember him as a, a promising undergraduate at LSE. Uh, it has to be said he spent much more time doing student politicking, uh, perfecting the arts, which he's demonstrated so fully as consumer uh, champion uh, and indeed becoming a notable general secretary of the LSE Students' Union. But he should really have learned an little bit about economics, as indeed should the Liberal Party, because the Liberal Party, uh, which of course is merely a proxy, we're talking about proxy war, a proxy socialist party, the Liberal Party under Sir Ed Davey has actually proposed the equivalent of furlough to deal with the fuel crisis. And Ed Davey, with that masterly absurdity, which only a Lib Democrat could possibly muster, said, oh, it'll only cost 30 billion, only a tenth of what we spent on Covid. And so the road to Weimar begins. Mm -hmm. Now, I could stop there. It's a good line, isn't it? And so the road to Weimar begins. I mean, I began a few, a couple of years ago when we were talking about COVID, uh, talking about the Chinese road, uh, saying that, you know, get a Chinese virus, finish with a Chinese society. And I think there's been a strong measure of that. Uh, but more importantly, we are now seeing that the essential legacy is inflation. But again, why nothing from the opposition? Why nothing from the BBC? Why nothing from those rabid voices of the media? Because, of course, they were all in it. Sunak was in it. Boris was in it. Starmer was in it. Rachel Reeves was in it. The BBC was in it. The Times was in it. The Daily Mail was in it. Martin Lewis was in it. They were all clamouring for lockdown. They were all clamouring for furlough. Every, the entire civil service, Sir Tom's, Sir Tom's collar, the permanent secretary of the Treasury, Every single one of them has dirty hands, which is why none of them can point out the filth on Boris Johnson's. I'm afraid no one. We really are, unless we take sharp steps, unless we think, unless we look at things critically and firmly, we really are taking steps on the road to Weimar. Hello and thank you for watching David Starkey Talks. If, as I very much hope, you're enjoying them, why not become more actively involved and join my Members Club? As a member, you'll be able to take part in the members-only weekly question and answer session, suggest topics for forthcoming videos and have priority booking for my forthcoming live events. And while you're at it, why not have a look at the store page on my website, davidstarkey.com. There you can purchase t-shirts and other merchandise, buy signed copies of my books, and if you're feeling brave and a bit flush, even arrange to take me out to lunch. Thank you once again for watching. I look forward to hearing from you and to welcoming you to my members club.